Join with me in our call to worship from Psalm 100. I'll read the whole and encourage you to read the dark. Cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is a gracious God, whose mercy is everlasting, and whose faithfulness endures to all generations. Let us pray. O oh God, you are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. Your works everywhere praise you, and your glory is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore we praise you, blessed and holy Trinity, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Join with me as we stand and sing our first hymn together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Join with me. be seated. Hear our call to confession. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penance, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done justice, 
loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare unto you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now coming to the part of our worship in which we hear the sacred scriptures, we ask the Holy Spirit to open us. Prepare our hearts, O Spirit of God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapters 58, verses 3 through 9. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot say as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. It is only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in a sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is it not this kind, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to lose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? It is not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer and you will cry for help and he will say, here I am. And now um, I will be reading a scripture scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
awesome. Mm. I don't know how many times I've heard it. It's been expressed in many different ways by people inside the church and also by people outside the church. It's a statement about faith that is apparently characteristic of the times we live in. And here it is. My religion is a private thing. My faith is between God and me. I think I know at least in part what they mean. I think when anybody says, my faith is a private thing, what they probably mean is that my faith is a very personal thing, very intimate, in ways that are very difficult to express. Maybe they also mean, I won't parade my faith. I won't wear it like a badge to impress people. Won't carry it like a weapon to coerce people. We understand this, don't we? All of us who seek to walk with God have some aspects of that sacred communion that is very intimate to us. We have some experiences and some insights that are pretty private, and they ought to be. Furthermore, none of us has any business of making a show out of our faith. Jesus warns against this. He says, never give alms or pray to be seen by somebody else. You give and you pray in secret. And your heavenly Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And as for the business of intruding on other people with our faith, that is, trying to coerce, or manipulate them into believing what we believe, the Spirit of Jesus leaves no room for this either. He honors other people's freedom. It's true that some believers are always shouting their religion, saying everything they know to everybody in their path. I believe faith in Christ is sometimes a shout, is sometimes a whisper, and sometimes even silence. So when someone says, my faith is a private thing, we can nod our heads and understand at least in part what that might mean. Unfortunately, that's not what it all means. Too often, when people like us claim to have private faith, what is mostly meant is, my faith makes no public commitment in church. My faith expresses nothing to my neighbors my co-workers, my friends at school, or the stranger along my path. My faith takes no public stands, says nothing to public issues, makes no impact on my community, my church, my world. When faith becomes that private, we can still call it faith, but we must not call it Christian faith. Why? Because Christian faith is the faith of Christ. 
And his faith was relentlessly public. Which is not to say he talked about everything he knew. He kept some holy secrets. And he didn't coerce anybody. And he never showed off anything of his religion. But what he believed kept finding constant, unambiguous expression in public by deeds and by clear words. His faith was a passion to take hold of his world and give it some new shape. So he went out and talked with people, talked openly, unashamedly, and did things in their sight that pointed to the glory of God. He provided food for the hungry and healing for the sick. And then he told them where it came from. He spoke to the public issues of his day. At least once he publicly rebuked a crooked politician in his land. And countless times he rebuked a gaggle of crooked preachers. Preachers are open season, open game, according to Jesus, so far away. He spoke to the issues that people in the streets were debating. He spoke by deed or by word to care for the elderly, to the divorced law, to the capital punishment of women for adultery, to the issue whether to bear arms or not against those who are your enemies, against racial segregation. He spoke publicly of God's judgment on his nation. He spoke publicly of God's incredible grace to anyone who would have it. His light was a fiercely public light. He took a lot of public risk. And when they executed him, it was on a public cross. And this same Jesus, when he was speaking to his disciples, said to them, You are salt. Salt for the earth. You are light for this world. Let your light therefore shine in the presence of other people so they can see your good works and give glory to your Father which is in heaven. If we want to live in the company of Jesus, He is saying to us, there are public implications of your discipleship. The world around you should feel the unmistakable impact of what you believe and who you are. Your faith can't be that private. And how wonderfully typical it is of him that when he told them this, he used two metaphors. Your salt, your light, salt. Take just a pinch and put it on your tongue and your whole mouth says, whoa, what's that? Your whole system wakes up. Or take just a sprinkling of salt and put it into a cup of warm water and instantly... It permeates the whole thing. Every single drop is different. Salt digs in, transforms what it touches. It adds flavor, keeps meat from going bad. It melts ice. Salt stings. Salt gives release when it rolls down your face in the form of tears. Salt gives Life. Long ago, 
Centuries during the prophets of Israel, when a baby was born, parents would rub the infant in salt and wrap it up for seven days. It was partly medicine, partly sacred symbol. Palestinian Arabs still salt their babies, so do Armenians. Jesus is saying the instant you become God's child, you are salted. That's who you are. You flavor things. You melt things. You sting. You give flavor. And you're light. In a pitch dark world, and it is darker than most of us realize out there. God's children are street lights to travel by, lamp lights to learn by, porch lights to come home by. And if you are a child of God, you are a helicopter search light, finding survivors out on a dark sea. You're a bed light for an anxious child. You're a surgeon's light probing to find disease tissue. You're laser light for cutting and healing. Your life is like the flinging open of shutters to let in a flood of sunlight. Your life is like snow that reflects a brightness all over. Your life is like birthday candles, like dancing, to say there's something here to celebrate. Light is warmth, welcome, courage, comfort, judgment, beauty, the truth, wisdom, joy, and in this world, says Jesus, you are light. Now please notice what salt and light have in common. With each other, salt and light have in common that they are both quiet and unobtrusive. So it is not our calling to be the loudest show in town or the flashiest. And it's not bad that we are outnumbered, for salt and light also have in common that the smallest amount can make the biggest difference. Most of all, what they have in common is this. It is the nature of both salt and light to penetrate and to permeate. You walk into a dark room with a candle. The candle light radiates out into the dark. Every inch of it is changed, at least a little. Or if you sprinkle the salt in a pot of water, it permeates every bit of it. It's all changed. And so to be in the company of Jesus is to live in a fellowship that gets into the world, thoroughly into it, all mixed in it, touching it all, influencing it all, helping it to change it all. Specifically, it means that all our personal encounters with other folk out there this week, where we work, where we visit, where we go to school, where we play online, wherever it is that we are out and about, every personal contact is an opening for our life's mission. The mission of our life is not in big things. It is over and over and over again in the small touching of life after life 
after life, like salt, like light. We are talking now about the personal testimony of your words, your gestures, your behavior, and your character. If Christ lives in you, then Christ shines like light how you treat everyone along your way. If Christ lives in you, then he shakes out like salt in the words you speak and in the choices that you make. This is the salt and light of your personal witness to the love of Christ. There is also the salt and light of our collective witness of Christ together as one community church. As the community of Christ, we develop definite strategies to penetrate and to permeate the world out there for Christ. Specific actual deeds. Those are being planned for us each month here to feed, to clothe, to build, to teach, to reach with the gospel, and to show gospel by doing the kinds of things Jesus does out there. We find ways, as Jesus did, to speaking to the structures of our society, holding up our people's sins to the light of salting public policies that are more peaceable and just. Toward all these things, we pour out our money together, our time together, our mutual concentrated energies together, all poured out. Why? Because these are God's salt. And God's salt does not belong in the salt shaker, but out in the world. And there's a hard part here. If we don't, Jesus renounces us. Christians who refuse to be salt and light in their world, Christ has no use for. And you heard this warning from the text of Scripture today. You are salt for this world, but if salt stops being salty, it is worth nothing but being thrown out and being trampled on. In Jesus' day, much of the salt was not all pure, and it was mixed with other minerals. And if the mix were left unused for a length of time, Eventually, the salt would go flat. And what people did with this stuff was to dump it out in the ruts of the road and into the mud puddles of the road. It was worthless for anything else but to be thrown out. And the same destiny comes to all churches who refuse to bear a real witness to their world. If we are playing church, dressing up nice, talking nice, and having a nice little religious experience together, and never getting hurled out there with the actual word to someone else that God loves them, if we are not talking to people about the gospel, if we are not showing it to them by what we do, it, in the likeness of Jesus if we are not helping our culture to deal with its sins and to change toward righteousness, then the world ought to write us off. And it will. And this nation, at least in part, already has. I'm not worried about the death of the church. The church is in no danger of dying. It's worse than that. The church is in danger of becoming a colossal irrelevance. The world in real crisis, and we 
are not word or deed that makes any difference to them. God has made you and me salt already, light already for this world, for this time, for this day in which we live. So he is not asking you to achieve something. He is not asking you to implement something. All he is asking is that we be what we are. Well, I love you guys truthfully. What are we? Most of us aren't brilliant. Most of us aren't brave. Most of us aren't even too good. Most of us are just wounded sinners who for no reason except for God's incredible grace have learned that Christ died for us and have found His living Spirit wanting to live and move in us. You are already salt and already light. All Jesus is saying in this text is don't cover it up. And the way he says it, did you hear? He says, if you're light, if you light a lamp, you never put it under a bowl. You set it on a lamp stand. So if God has made your life a lamp, the options now before you are a bowl or the lampstand. You can let your fear put a bowl over your lamp. You can let other people's expectations of you put a bowl over your particular light. You can let your fill in the blank. Loneliness, boredom, helplessness. Put a bowl over your light. The bowls are endless in this world. Or you can choose to be openly who you are because Christ found you. You can shine with your world and with your deeds, your words can be heard. We can do that together as one community church with what God has made us to be. Oh, let your light shine in the presence of other people so they will see your good works and hear your good words and give glory to the living God who loves them. Friends, if it's the faith of Christ you've got, it's time to go public. Out of the salt shaker and into the world. Out of the bowl and high and lifted up clear on a lampstand. Today, you do have a choice. A bowl or a lampstand. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for lifting us to such a splendid purpose. And we ask today to be delivered from anything that covers us from what you've been trying to create in us and among us. Make us free to make public commitments to your church, to give and to live like we mean it. Help us to make a public confession of who you are before those with whom we live at work, at home, at school, everywhere we go. Give to your children in this place particularly new courage today to say yes. Because you have touched me, I will shine. Help us to say it well to you now and better later on to shine. 
Hear us now, O Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Join with me as we sing a hymn today and open our hearts to an affirmation of faith, a faith of our fathers. Would you stand and sing? come now to make a prayer together, a petition and intercession before the Lord. Let us ready our hearts as we bow our hearts and our heads in prayer. O God, we thank you for your love for us this day. Hear our prayers, O God, as you stir us to be fast before you, being your people of faith and love. We thank you for your mercy and grace. Stir within us, O God, to be prayer partners with you in praying for our world, for its healing, for its salvation. We love you. We thank you for your love for us in Jesus Christ. Hear us now, O God, as we give you thanks for this church, for our community, and for the opportunities for us to be light and salt to you. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus, as we commit to you this day to be yours in this coming week. Now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We come to the time in our worship where we offer ourselves of our 
time, our talents, our service, our monies, our prayers, all kinds of things. We are called to give. Having experienced the living God in this place, we covenant with God to give back here and out to the world. Jesus, he calls us to be good stewards of the wider circles of our influence and to increase this, to alleviate hunger and pain and strife in this world. He asks us to go and be his hands in this world. And when we follow God's leadership, we demonstrate the love of Christ to every soul we meet. We discover that we've got God's arms around us, empowering us, teaching us what it means to be light and salt in our world. For this we give thanks. And we call ourselves to give more. More of what we have been because we know more about his love for us and for the world. For this we give thanks. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we acknowledge that you are our Father and we are your children. Our neighbors are our brothers and sisters in Christ. To their service and to your glory, we dedicate ourselves, our hearts and our minds, our wills and works. Strengthen our resolve to stand fast in your faith, to speak your word in love and to seek to help of your Holy Spirit to work willingly for your perfect kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Would you stand and sing our doxology as we praise God from whom all blessings flow. stay standing as we sing our closing hymn today, a wonderful hymn of our childhood, a folk hymn that stood with us by truth that we have been given light and we should let it shine. Join with us.
the grace of the living Lord Jesus Christ fall afresh upon you with strength and power to know that your wick is not wet. It is ready to be lit and to carry out into the world the grace and power and love of Christ. Go, light your light under the light of Christ and let it shine, let it shine. For he loves you so and loves your world. In Jesus' name, amen. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine.